In the previous few videos on the wave equation, we solved the wave equation over an infinite domain using the d'Alembert method. But in this video, we're going to solve the wave equation over a finite domain. So let's set up our problem. Suppose I have a string of length l whose displacement in the vertical direction u is governed by this partial differential equation, this wave equation. Note that c here is a real number that represents what the speed of this wave would be if it were allowed to move in an infinite domain. Now since the wave here is confined to a finite string, c has a different meaning here altogether, which we'll discuss later. Anyway, let's say that this finite string were fixed at each end, u equals 0 at one end and u equals 0 at the other end. As a result, my two boundary conditions are given by the following. In addition, we still have two initial conditions because of the two derivatives in time in my original PDE. So let's suppose that our initial conditions are the most generic ones possible, where the initial value of u at some time 0 is some arbitrary initial displacement u0 of x, and at time 0 the vertical velocity of the string is du by dt, which is an arbitrary initial velocity that I'll set to v0 of x. Now how are we going to solve this PDE? Well, it's going to be just like how we solve the heat equation on a finite domain by separation of variables. Recall that separation of variables is one of the most common techniques used for solving PDEs, especially those which apply over a finite domain. It's important to keep in mind though that separation of variables only applies in certain situations. So for this wave equation, it applies when the PDE is linear and homogeneous, and by linear I mean linear in the dependent variable, so in the function u that you want to solve for. Non-constant coefficients are allowed, however. We also want the boundary conditions to be linear and homogeneous. So for example, these two boundary conditions, the most general ones possible that I've written here, one boundary condition is at x equals zero and the other is at x equals l, where alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are constants. These two boundary conditions both satisfy the linear and homogeneous requirement. So now that we've gone over the requirements behind using separation of variables, let's go over how separation of variables actually works, particularly in the context of this one-dimensional wave equation problem. Notice that in this PDE problem, both the PDE and the boundary conditions are linear and homogeneous, which means that it is indeed possible to use separation of variables. Now in separation of variables, what we do is we assume that our function u that we want to solve for can be separated into a product of two functions, one of which is exclusively a function of x, and the other is exclusively a function of t. However, this separable solution isn't exactly unique, because there are infinitely many of these solutions that satisfy the PDE and the boundary conditions, so we could simply write each of these individual solutions using a subscript n as an index. Now because our PDE and boundary conditions are linear, we can say that any linear combination of these individual solutions would also be a valid solution. So the most general possible solution we can come up with is the sum from n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n times capital X sub n times capital T sub n, where the a sub n's are just coefficients. Now you might wonder, if any linear combination of these solutions works in terms of satisfying the PDE and the boundary conditions, how is our solution even meaningful and unique? After all, I could just use whatever I want for these coefficient values and come up with something that properly satisfies the PDE and the boundary conditions. Well, not quite, because there's only one linear combination with a particular set of coefficients that satisfies the initial conditions. So these initial conditions really ensure that we end up with a unique linear combination and thus a meaningful solution. Since we now know what we're doing, we can go ahead and solve the PDE. To do this, we'll need to substitute our separable solution into the PDE, so we'll need its second time derivative and its second spatial derivative, because that's what the wave equation contains. If we differentiate u with respect to t, then the function big X only contains terms in small x, so for the partial derivative in time, we can just treat big X as a constant. So the derivative of u with respect to t is just big X times the time derivative of capital T. If we now differentiate with respect to time again, we get capital X times the second derivative of capital T with respect to time. Notice how we've got ordinary derivatives now on the right hand side, and it's because the function capital T is only a function of time and not any other variables. The same logic can be applied to the second derivative of u with respect to x, and we end up with capital T times the second derivative of capital X with respect to x. Note that because we're differentiating with respect to x, capital T now gets treated as a constant in the partial differentiation. 
Let's now plug these two terms, the second partial of u with respect to t and the second partial with respect to x, into our PDE. And if we do that, we'll get something like this. Now here's where the idea of separating variables comes in. We'll now put all the terms containing time on one side and all the terms containing the x position on the other side. We'll also take the c squared and stick it on the time side. So now we're effectively dividing both sides by capital X and then dividing both sides by capital T and c squared. We've basically now separated the x and the t. Now the left hand side is only a function of the time t, while the right hand side here is only a function of the position x. So if I change time, then my capital T, which is a function of time, could change, and the second derivative of capital T, which is also a function of time, could also change. However, changing time doesn't change anything on the right hand side because there's nothing there which is time dependent. So even though the individual terms on the left might change, their combination doesn't change because the combination has to equal the right hand side, which is constant with time. Similarly, if I change the position x, then the left hand side of this equation stays constant, which means that the right hand side must also remain constant. And the reason for that is that the left hand side doesn't depend on the position x. So even if I change my position x and the individual terms on my right hand side change, their combination still has to remain constant because it equals the left hand side, which remains constant with position. So in the end, changing either x or t doesn't affect either half of the equation, so we say that both halves must be equal to a constant. You can also prove this to yourself by taking the derivative of both sides with respect to x and t to show that the whole equation actually equals a constant. The problem now though is that we don't know what this constant is. Specifically, do we pick a negative constant, a positive constant, or a zero constant? I'm actually going to show you though, using the process of elimination, that the constant has to be negative. So let's go through the failed cases first. Let's start by choosing a positive constant. If we do that, we can write our constant as lambda squared, since squaring any real number will always give you a positive value, which means our separated differential equation will look something like this. We can now break up this expression into two separate ordinary differential equations, one in terms of t and the other in terms of x. If we rearrange the equation in t, we'll get this, which means that capital T is the sum of two exponential functions of time, where capital A and capital B are integration constants. Similarly, for the differential equation involving x, we have the following. Again, we can use the very basic rules from ODE's class and write our solution capital X as the sum of two exponentials in X, where C and D are again arbitrary integration constants. Because the solution to our overall PDE now is the product of capital T and capital X, we can write U down as the following. Now, here's the problem with this equation. As we let time approach infinity, this solution blows up because of this capital A term, this positive exponential term in time, so that just leaves this B term for the time part and the sum of these exponentials for the X part, because A has to be zero, because otherwise then the equation will blow up at an infinite time. Now if A does happen to be zero and we set A to be zero, we're left with an exponential that decays with time. And that sounds great, but we still have to satisfy the boundary conditions, which I'm going to rewrite up here. U is zero at both edges of the string, and in order to satisfy both of these boundary conditions, you can actually show that both C and D must be zero. To satisfy the first boundary condition at x equals zero, you eventually get an expression where C plus D must equal zero, because B obviously can't be zero, because then U just becomes trivial. But then, if c plus d is 0 and c equals negative d, then in order to satisfy the second boundary condition, you must have c also equal to 0, because then the difference of these exponentials can't be 0, which means that the coefficient c must then be 0, which will effectively mean that both your constant c and d must be 0, and you end up with a trivial solution anyway. So now since c and d must be 0 to satisfy these boundary conditions, we have a trivial solution when we pick the constant in our PDE to be positive, but we don't need trivial solutions because they're kind of obvious and don't add to our understanding very much. Additionally, if we do have a trivial solution for all x and all t, then there's really no way for us to satisfy a non-trivial initial condition at time zero, and that's why we reject this option.
But now let's look at the case where the constant is zero. If we do that, our separated differential equation will look something like this. Once again, we can break up this expression into two separate ordinary differential equations, one in terms of t and the other in terms of x. If we rearrange the equation in t, we'll get the second derivative of capital T with respect to time is zero, which means that capital T is just a line with a slope a and intercept b. For the ODE involving x, we have the second derivative of capital X with respect to x equals zero, which means that we can write our solution capital X as a linear function once again. Now because our solution u to the PDE is the product of capital T and capital X, we can write it down as the following. Now this equation has a similar problem as our hypothesized solution for a positive constant in case one. As time approaches infinity, this solution increases without bound, which is why capital A then must be zero. Then when we bring up our two boundary conditions, we find that C and D must also be zero in order for the boundary conditions to be satisfied. And since C and D must be zero, and since A is also zero, we once again end up with a trivial solution. And as mentioned earlier, trivial solutions are useless and don't help us when we have to satisfy initial conditions. So we reject this case as well. So the only possibility we're left with is that we have a negative constant, but I'm going to discuss that in the next video. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.